Hey everyone, Jay from the St. Balasar University English Club here. That's right, I have changed my name. It's really nice to get to meet you all again for the first time. Today I want to share seven poetry writing tips that have helped me become a published poet. Recently I've scored some of my first major publications, including an upcoming poem in the journal and a poem that's currently on display at the Art and History Museum in my home state of North Carolina. These milestones in my writing have given me an excuse to reflect, so I wrote these seven tips partly for myself to clarify for my own sake what I believe to be true about writing, but also because I wanted to share with you guys what I've learned at my master's program, or at least some of it. So while these seven tips are geared towards poets specifically, I think you prosers out there might also find something you can carry into your own practice, no matter where you're at with it. At least, I hope that will be the case. I should also mention that these seven tips are based on an essay by poet Rita Dove titled Seven Wives for Seven Mothers, in which she outlines seven writing tips she originally gave at a writing conference called Cave Canem, followed by seven more unique to the essay. A little convoluted, but the main takeaway is that Rita Dove wrote an essay that contains seven writing tips, plus seven more that comment on the original seven. I won't explain all of Dove's writing advice because it's her advice and she can explain it better than I could. So if you're interested in hearing what she has to say, I recommend you go read the essay, which is available for free online. I will though list the seven original tips to give you a sense of the kind of advice she has to offer. Number one, no excuses. Number two, notebooks, not journals. Number three, every roadblock is an opportunity to explore the neighborhood. Number four, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, but if swing is all it's got, you might as well join a band and take it on the road. I like that one. While you're writing, never think of your audience. They will find you. Number six, each word is a living, breathing thing. Number seven, silence is the shadow of a word. As you can see, these have kind of a range from self-explanatory to a little more opaque, but Dove does unpack all of them in greater detail if you're interested. Two quick disclaimers before we get started. These were written as if to a younger version of myself, still an undergrad and still uncertain about whether or not to pursue poetry at all, so if they sound a little authoritative in places, it's because I'm talking to myself more than to a public audience, and I feel comfortable being a little harsh, even a little strict with myself at times. Also, these are seven pieces of advice, of which I still pretty frequently fall short. So although they're principles that I believe to be useful, and in some cases even true, I'm not able to execute them with perfect accuracy or reliability. I hope that reading these I won't sound as though I think I have everything figured out because I certainly don't have everything figured out and I don't think that I do. With all that out of the way, here's my seven, I don't even really know what to call these, I've been calling them tips, which they sort of are, they're not really statements because several of them are questions which I guess means they're all sentences. Seven sentences sounds really terrible though. Maybe seven readings? Okay, okay. If I call them seven readings, then I can associate them each with a tarot card. Hold on. Seven readings. The chariot. Can the poem envision a future? Poems frequently lack the narrative arcs of prose, although not always, of course. And yet we expect a successful poem to move, to escalate, to gain momentum. So if not in a sequence of events in which the choices characters make lead to greater stakes, where does that momentum dwell in a poem? Here's one way of thinking about it. Imagine a successful poem as having two temporal realities it must activate, a lyric present and a lyric future. The lyric present is made up of the events of the poem, the movement of its narrative or lyrical logic. The poem's quote-unquote events may be chronological or maybe not. They may happen 10 years or 10 seconds apart. They are the content of the words on the page, the images, the sentences, the metaphors, the diction, everything the speaker does or says or thinks. Really, the poem itself can only exist in the present, because poems only happen as they're being read, and the act of reading can only ever take place in the present, or an infinitely divisible sequence of consecutive presents if you want to be really annoying about it. If the lyric present is the poem itself, then the lyric future is what occurs after the poem is over, and is often set up at the exit of the poem. A memorable poem imagines a future and projects itself into it, thus allowing the reader to continue to carry the poem with them even after they have finished reading. Think of Butthole by Sam Sachs. Side note, if you listened to our Jordan Peterson episode, then yes, I'm going to talk about this poem again. It's so wonderfully bizarre and grotesque and does so much incredible work that I really think it's worth it. 
The events of the poem, its lyric present, happen at many different times. The reader is frequently not permitted to know, and doesn't really need to know, when these events occurred relative to each other. What matters is the succession of moments that ebb and flow in intensity, each activating the lyric present by way of their novelty, insight, play, and discovery. I mean, think of the humor of that line, Sweet you who birthed iron when I took too many women's multivitamins claiming there's no such thing as gender. It's so joyful and so surprising, and it's willing to make fun of itself. The final couplet, especially the segment Gold Band that weds my strange body to this strange, strange earth, which also was key to my argument in the Jordan Peterson video, gestures into the lyric future. These lines imply that the speaker will continue to be an active agent in their material reality, will continue to live and have experiences even after the poem has ended. The line also invites the reader to think of their own body, the ways in which living in a body may be strange and therefore a site of uncertainty, and therefore if we press into that uncertainty rather than resist it, discovery. The poem outlives the words that comprise it because the end of the poem gestures forward into an indefinite future. Even poems that seem to point back into the past are really pointing into the future because the past is over and will continue to exist mainly as ever-shifting moments of recollection, all of which will happen in the future. That bit about the past being in the future might sound confusing, and I would get why. So here's a poem that I hope will clear it up. This is Three Desk Objects by Margaret Atwood, who, if you didn't know, was a poet before she was a prose writer, and her poetry is really excellent. This poem first appeared in Poetry Magazine in April of 1969, and it's called Three Desk Objects. What suns had to rise and set, what eyes had to blink out, what hands and fingers had to let go of their heat, before you appeared on my desk, black light, portable and radiant, and you, my electric typewriter, with your cord and hungry plug, drinking a sinister transfusion from the other side of the wall. What histories of slaughter have left these scars on your keys? What multiple deaths have set loose this clock, the small wheels that grind their teeth under the metal scalp? My cool machines, resting there so familiar, so hard and perfect, I am afraid to touch you. I think you will cry out in pain. I think you will be warm, like skin. Put my whole poetry essay into that one. That's the kind of linguistic invention that George Peterson would sob if he heard. This poem, in which the speaker wrestles with the traumatic origins of ordinary objects under industrial capitalist systems, concerns itself with the past lives of the objects. The hands that were injured to produce them, the deaths that occurred in pursuit of the resources necessary to assemble them. In the outro of the poem, the speaker fears that if she touches the objects, they'll be warm like skin. In other words, will they still bear the trace of the living that were oppressed so that the objects could come into being? And yet, the second lives given to the object's makers are not joyful, but are a sight of horror for the speaker, who is forced to confront that she, as a purchaser and owner of these objects, is complicit in the process of their production. Now, every time she looks at the objects in the present, she will look into the past, and seeing the trauma that dwells there continue to be horrified in the future. I've learned to be wary in my own work of poems that linger too long on a single emotion, no matter how present or profound that feeling may be in the moment of writing. These kinds of poems tend to stop when the feeling does, and thus lack a futurity that will make them memorable. While a lyric present grants a reader an experience while they're reading, a lyric future answers the question, so what? The future is the what. The thing given to the reader as they exit through the gift shop of the poem. Number two, Six of Cups. What's left to say about fireflies? Be wary of advice that warns against writing about quote unquote cliched topics. In my experience, it tends not to be topics, but rather specific chunks of language that are cliched. Tough as nails is a cliche, yes, but the poetic possibilities of neither toughness nor nails have been exhausted. In the realm of fantasy writing, critics will sometimes decry stories containing magic schools as overdone tropes. Imagine, for example, if in our Fourth Wing podcast episode, Andrew and I had dismissed the book purely on the basis that it took place in a magical military training school. This would be ridiculous. 
Because it isn't the schools themselves that are quote-unquote overdone, rather it's what authors have done with those ideas that can get tired. I think what is often meant when critics say a concept is tropey is that the markets for stories containing the concepts associated with, say, magic schools, a main character set apart from the rest of their classmates by origin or talent, a faction system within the school, magical creatures living alongside the students, quirky professors, are oversaturated. In this particular moment, there are many stories containing magic schools competing for a consumer's attention, some of which are, yes, trying to cash in on a trend, hence the fatalistic insistence that magic schools are literally so over. In poetry, we may not have magic schools, but we do have the moon, cicadas, flesh, childhood pets, especially dogs, Greek myth, and birds. While it's always a fruitful exercise to question our own motives for writing about a given topic, to investigate what lies behind our obsessions, it's also vital that we write into those obsessions. While poets have been observing the moon for forever, no one has ever been any of us in our exact positionalities writing about the moon in this precise historical moment. If the moon is of genuine interest to us, if we find ourselves writing about it not because we've internalized that the moon is what poetry is supposed to be about, or what's in right now, then we ought to write about it. And if we write enough, we're all but statistically guaranteed to write something novel, interesting, maybe even revelatory. If we still find ourselves concerned we're failing to say something that hasn't already been said, then we can turn to extant poetry about the moon and see what new options remain available to us. I'm certain that we'll discover more than we might have at first thought. Number three, judgment reversed. Poems are not content. Ever since we started the English Club podcast, I've caught myself time and again calling my work, be it my essays, podcasts, or poems, content. And it's something I want to stop doing because I think it devalues my labor and my passion. The problem with content is not so much the word itself, but rather its associated verb, consume. Poems ask a lot of readers. Much more than most other kinds of writing, I would argue. That doesn't make them better, it's just a feature. They ask readers to notice encoded patterns such as meter, image system, and tone-producing diction that combine what the readers notice in order to reach a conclusion or conclusions about the poem's aims. This can be really difficult, but in its ideal form is a rewarding experience that grants the reader access to experiences otherwise impossible. These experiences lie at the core of poetry's goals, but to access them, readers must be engaged with the work. Readers must choose intentionally to do this, read poetry, and not that go watch Adventure Time. How does this process of pattern noticing work? Let's go back to the Atwood poem. Throughout that piece, the desk objects are continually personified. The typewriter is hungry, it drinks. Its keys are scarred, the clock has teeth and scalp. By describing these items using the language of human bodies, Atwood directs the reader to think not just about the objects themselves, but about the bodies that were sacrificed to produce them. From here, it's much less of an associative leap to begin thinking about what we, as dwellers in a world where many of our goods are cheaply produced in third world countries, all know to be true about the conditions in the factories and other sites of production. The poem, in a sense, teaches us how to read it. But we have to be paying attention. The word I'm writing towards is active where poetry asks its readers to be active agents, content asks mainly that its participants consume, swallow, and is therefore more passive. There's absolutely a time and place for this kind of passive consumption. I'm probably gonna go watch an episode, or maybe seven, of Adventure Time after this, and I'm still in the early seasons where things haven't gotten complicated yet, so it is mostly just like watching all the lovely colors and whimsical antics. And that's, that's fine, it's good even, but it's not poetry. And we should treat poetry like poetry, and content like content. Number four, two of swords. You can use the second person. If you began writing prose before you began writing poetry, as I did, you were likely taught, or internalized without ever explicitly being told, not to write in the second person. This is a common prose imperative I can generally sign on to. Although the second person might at first seem like a suitable tool for inserting a reader into a story, 
it risks achieving the opposite effect as soon as the you character makes a choice the reader wouldn't have made. At this point, the reader is liable to find themselves confused or irritated by the story and begin focusing on those emotions rather than the story itself. One of the few contexts in which the second person works well in prose is in advertising. I remember being taught it's also good for travel writing, but in today's world that's really just another kind of advertising, so I won't count it as a separate thing. Brief medication ads describe your symptoms and how good you'll feel after taking medication. That's about the most complex scenario the second person can handle in English language prose. The longer these go on, the more the you starts to stand out, and feel separate from you, the reader. Not so in poetry, though. There, there are at least two overlapping effects the second person can achieve. My favorite is the establishment of a psychological tone. Poems addressed to a you figure that is really the speaker allow a poet to examine a character's mental landscape from the point of view of that landscape, creating recursive loops that lend themselves well to chiasms or moments where there's a circle occurring within the text. These are rewarding for the reader because when they find them, they feel smart and feel like they're really participating in the poem. Baked into that first function is also the second one, implicating the reader. Although this carries with it some of the same risks inherent to second-person prose, it's easier to implicate the reader in a poem, I would argue, because the quote-unquote characters make fewer narrative choices, usually. Rather, they may make observations and associative leaps, which by nature of implication the reader isn't able to perform alongside them. This can ideally produce more intrigue and excitement than frustration. Here's a poem that leans more into that second feature, that is, implicating the reader. And let me make it clear that when I say implicating, I'm not using that word negatively in the sense that the reader is implicated in some crime. What I mean is that they're participating in the poem, they are being written into it. So here is Self-Portrait as a Block of Ice by poet Donica Kelly. Self-Portrait as a Block of Ice. What the Tongue Wants. Supplication and the burn of crystals expanding. To be always a waxing, a waning, and in waxing, again, not ever the same. Waste and deferral. Accumulation and deferral. You are flesh, and you are water. Through the flesh, you are only muscle. And of the water, you are saltless and clean. Be a caution, a reckoning. Be a thing that breaks before it bends. In this poem, the speaker, who is a woman of color, as we know primarily from the context of the rest of the collection in which the poem appears, Bestiary, urges herself to be a thing that breaks before it bends. In other words, a thing that does not modify itself to suit hegemonic, imperialist, or other oppressive structures. This poem is likely to resonate more strongly with people in minoritarian identities, particularly those of color, and in that way, it's also finding its own audience, which I think proves Rita Dove's point. The poem also calls the speaker and thus the reader to change, to be always a waxing, a waning, and in waxing again not ever the same. The poem is a caution against stagnation, and it presents the reader with an opportunity to give themselves permission to grow through change. Number five, four of swords. Get comfortable with silence. Back when I was in high school, a therapist once asked me if I was comfortable with silence, and I told her of course I was because I didn't know what she meant and I didn't have the confidence to ask. The truth was that my life up to that point had been, and still sometimes is, defined by noise. I listened to music when I was driving, cooking, or just walking around the house. I watched video essays at dinner. When I finished my evening writing, I would go straight to the TV for a horror movie. My moments were, are, bracketed with sound. There have always been times when I've gone to bed thinking, I've hardly thought at all today. The times when I haven't been listening to something, I have been writing, reading tarot, disc golfing, talking to friends, whatever, doing something. If you're a person with a phone, and if you're watching this, then I think you are, then I bet you've had a similar experience, and I can bet you've also had the experience of realizing when the bedside lamp clicks off and your phone is laying face down on the mattress beside you like a dispassionate lover, maybe it would be nice to just avoid all the thoughts that are starting to crowd into your mind as if to make up for the time they lost during the day. And wouldn't it be nice in that moment to pick up your phone and put something on just to fall asleep to? If you can, I would urge you to resist. So much pre-writing happens in silence. 
so much opinion formation and personal reflection, which of course go on to inform poems, or whatever you write. Make a space for silence each day, if you can. I would discourage setting a timer or making the time at which you are silent the same time each day. These kinds of practices, while certainly helpful for some people, also risk turning silence into a chore, dull and dreaded. Try to be spontaneous with your silence. Allow your silence to be fresh and unexpected, like Number six, four of pentacles reversed. Get comfortable with discomfort. The thing that makes silence or any experience uncomfortable to endure is not the silence itself, of course, but the neurochemical reaction of discomfort resulting from silence's inherent uncertainty, the what now of it. If you can endure discomfort in silence, you'll be more prepared to endure it when it appears in your poems, and it must for your poems to be surprising. It's impossible to outline a poem the same way as a novel, an article, a research paper. This is because, just as the poem is a site of lyric experience for the reader, it is often a similar experience for the writer. This doesn't mean, of course, that poets enter into states of divine revelation whenever they write, and that the placement of each line is a decision that reliably induces orgasmic revelry. I wish. Rather, it means while the poet may, and likely does, go into a poem with a sense of what the poem's narrative will center, some of the images it will include and a sense of who its speaker is, a good poem will surprise the writer as they write. While composing, putting the language onto the page and seeing it represented there will make new opportunities for meaning making possible. Lyrical moves, such as enjambment that enables double or triple meanings, will present themselves in the early drafts and be tweaked in the successive ones to intensify their impacts. However, in the moments when the poet isn't discovering options or is afraid to approach the keyboard for a fear they won't discover any, there will be uncertainty and thus discomfort. We must be kind to ourselves. We must realize that the uncertainty we experience is normal, natural, and ultimately a phenomenon that will strengthen us not just as poets, but as people. We must give ourselves grace to write into, write toward discomfort, and still not always arrive at moments of lyric discovery. If we expect the discovery to happen every time, then what would be left to discover? Then how would we write poems? Number seven, the emperor reversed. Anger is contagious. Anger is frightening and powerful and necessary and exhausting to sustain. There is much to be angry about in the world today. One of the US's major political parties is attempting through legislation and the ever plausibly deniable encouragement of stochastic terrorism to chase queer people out of public spaces. Red states are amplifying economic violence against marginalized communities, especially those of color, which keeps those communities trapped in those states and thus susceptible to yet more kinds of harm. This year, over half a dozen species of birds endemic to Hawaii were officially reclassified from endangered to extinct, mainly as a result of the US's sustained colonial incursion onto the island chain. Millions of animals are slaughtered every single day in the US alone, with over a fifth of the meat products their bodies go on to produce ending up in landfills, never to serve even the barest utilitarian function. There is much to be angry about, and yet, anger is a mobilizing force that drives us to action. Anger can bring us into a poem by animating opening lines and stanzas that prevent us from looking away. Anger can move us out of a poem, encouraging us to imagine a lyric future in which we must act now or never. Anger struggles to sustain an entire poem though, just as it struggles to shape long-term solutions in the real world. Anger burns up and out and can use a poem as fuel before the piece has a chance to discover itself. Here is a poem that plays with anger, but doesn't allow it to limit the poem's possibilities. This is I Had a Little Cash by disabled poet Jillian Wise, who uh, writes a lot about disability and the politics of disability. I had a little cash and I was going to buy a gun, but they said, no, you can't. They said, believe in the police. We believe in the police. All you have to do is call them. They come running, running. I had a little cash to buy a gun, but they said, why would you do that? Who are you to do that? We do not do that with our money. I want to raise a goat in a field and protect the goat from a lion. If it's about animals, then may I buy a gun? I had the cash to buy the gun, but they said, you can't, you're a poet. Poets don't buy guns. So I dressed with my empty leather holster. In truth, I was thinking of some poets just south of here who go shooting. I know I am not alone. 
and wore my holster over my blue jeans and said to them, What do you want me to do? Should I wait for something to happen? Oh, you want me to run. You want me to go gunless, run legless across a field. Are you trying to get me killed? Jillian Wise is a poet who has made her pro-gun ownership stance very clear, sometimes to the bafflement of the larger poetry community. She wrote a really great essay called Why I Own a Gun, if you're interested uh, in a left-leaning pro-gun stance. I really enjoyed it. The poem I just read challenges my seventh writing tip and speaks to the fact that they won't work for everyone. The speaker is angry as we enter the poem and angry as we leave it, and yet the poem succeeds because of the way the anger transforms in the final line, at least in my opinion. The rhetorical question, are you trying to get me killed, moves beyond just the expression of anger, mobilizing it into a solution. The speaker is going to act on her justified anger and obtain the tools she needs to defend herself. I included this poem last because I think it's important to remember that my advice here is just that. Advice and it was primarily directed at myself anyway. It's not rules, or imperatives, or laws. While I hope that other writers and readers will find these at the very least interesting and maybe even useful, I really doubt anyone will locate utility in all of them, and that's totally fine. Also, I'm still really early in my writing career. Though I've been writing fiction since middle school, I only started writing poetry like three years ago. Think of that, three years ago. And just now I'm finishing up grad school. My perspectives on how to write poems will continue to develop, and I think that's more than just okay or good. It's necessary. As I continue in my practice to dwell with discomfort, to envision futures, to write about fireflies, I'll keep learning, or I hope I will. So be angry, absolutely. Allow yourself to embody the anger to which you are entitled, but don't forget to be other feelings too, to imagine a future in which other feelings might yet be possible. Thank you all for coming to Club today. It means a lot to me and Andrew to have you here. Which of these seven tips do you find most or least helpful? Are there any you definitely add if you made your own list? We're all about feedback here at the English Club, so let us know in the comments below. Check out our podcast, The English Club Podcast, where we offer revisions for books the internet has deemed doomed to mediocrity. And if you liked this essay, check out our others on the poetry of Jordan Peterson, the poetry of Marie from Persona 4, or that weird Sonic high school video that Andrew wrote. I haven't seen it myself, but I'm sure it's really good. If you like what we do here, leave a like and a subscribe on the way out.